Thank you very much for coming. Some of you have had a preamble already, of course, and uh, some of you have also met our ISACA guest from headquarters in the US, Chris, um, who is the chap who is in the sober um, attire just there. Um, but the event schedule is, as you can see here, the main event is the PWC part in terms of what, what we're here for, which is about security and cyber security. But this is, of course, I saw a London chapter. I would like to thank you all for selecting the new board and give us us opportunity to serve you all. Um, I think uh, last year was very good, um, and thanks to Ken uh, and his leadership and guidance. And also, uh, where we are today is on the foundations that were laid by various past presidents over the years. So I must thank them all to get us where we are today as second largest chapter. But as a president of the London chapter and your representative, I have a challenge for you. Um, I would say we are second largest. We all have to make it the largest chapter in the world. And we cannot do it, we cannot do it with each, every one of you engaging with your counterparts, your board, reaching out to people who wanted to be, want to be in cyber security, want to be in audit, want to be in risk management, want to be in governance, to enthuse them and tell them about the benefits of the becoming a SACA member and a SACA London chapter member. So please be our advocate and put your hand up, engage with us. I must admire Shahid sitting down here who just had a chat with me and said, I would like to speak at one of your events. And I looked at his badge and he works for Talk Talk. He can share our, his experience, you know, having one of the largest speeches. So that is a great opportunity for us to share our experiences with the rest of the members, and that's what you know, local chapters are all about, sharing each of their experiences. I will not take your, you know, much of your time because we have a great event and great speakers here. So I will again thank you all to select the new board. And uh, if there are, you know, uh, I think there are a few board members here, may, may I ask you to stand up so that the rest of the um, you know, members know? So new. Board members, please, can you stand up? All right, so at least we have board board members, including me. So please reach out to these. Um, you know, these are your kind of uh, board, of, you know, like you have a US board. It's kind of board or, or a source of input, providing input to us. So please use this opportunity when you see a board member, reach out to them, provide your input how we can be the largest and the best chapter in the world. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you very much, Deep. I'm just going to show you a few slides, but the reason why I'm doing that is because I want to tell you about the slides later. Right now, I'm rolling through to the slide for our next presenter. So these are our next two events. They're not actually our events. They're London, uh, sorry, they're um, BCS North London branch events. But you're welcome to sign up for them if you wish. And then we will get to the end of my deck. And I believe it's all been sewn together by the miracles of technology and our PDC, PWC colleagues. So we've rolled straight through to the first slide of our guest from Asaka. HQ in Chicago, and that is Chris DeMarle. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much, and I uh, really appreciate the ability to speak here tonight. Uh, my name is Chris DeMarle, so I'm a strategic account executive uh, with ISOC HQ, so that means I'm business development. And one of the things that has brought me out here today is that ISACA is undergoing a lot of changes. We've got a new president, and though I'm from the U.S., and, and the word president has been going around a lot lately, <laughs> I have nothing to do with that. <laughs> yeah. um, however, 
uh, in, in that, that same token, uh, we have a new CEO at ISACA International. Uh, so we're very excited about a lot of the new things that we're able to do, the, the things that we're able to partner with our chapters on. And as we heard from Deep, uh, the London chapter is a very important chapter to what we do. So really excited to be speaking with you guys and give you the things that you need in order to reach your goals and become the largest chapter in the world uh, over the next year or two. So guys, um, the other thing that I want to talk about uh, is a statement that I'll take from David Samuelson, who is our new CEO. And what he shared uh, in our state, uh, in, in one of our recent town halls is we were asked about the mission, right? The reason why we are here, why we are part of this nonprofit is because of the mission that we all believe in, right? To advance the understanding of audit, cybersecurity, IT, risk, and governance topics around the world. And I personally have been extremely gratified since I joined up with ISACA to be a part of that. We're all here because of the mission. And to David's statement, he said, we are all here for the mission, but there is no mission without the revenue, right? And so as much as sometimes those fees and those dues may feel like on an annual basis, uh, we are always looking to expand out the capabilities of ISACA, advance with governments around the world in order to ensure that you are getting the most value out of your membership and your alliance with what we can do for you. In that context, I'd like to just take a few minutes in this PowerPoint to talk about uh, the awareness of the three different channels of products that we're doing most frequently. Um, of course, we understand the mission that, to help you realize the positive potential of technology as well as to inspire confidence that enables that innovation that we're seeing globally. And just to talk for a moment about the scope of ISACA. For those that weren't aware, we have over 450,000 engaged professionals with over 135,000 members uh, in 220 chapters around the globe. So let's talk about what it is that we are doing to enable yourselves and the professionals that we engage with. First off is risk assessment enablement. The second item is enterprise training. And the third is the cybersecurity training platform or CSX Nexus, as many of you may have experienced it as. So uh, the first thing that I'll talk about is the risk assessment enablement. Uh, item number one. So uh, those of you that are aware, ISACA purchased the CMMI Institute, an important institution in the United States about four and a half years ago. Uh, the CMMI Institute created standards around uh, maturity. Uh, and in that, uh, in that process, as part of the United States government, it set standards that are now globally utilized. We have now launched the first product as the joint entity, which is known as the CMMI Cyber Maturity Platform. This is a cloud-based tool that allows organizations to do three things. First off, quantify risk using globally accepted standards, specifically the CMMI maturity model. Secondly, to create a prioritized roadmap on what organizations can do in order to advance their cybersecurity maturity. And then the third of which is have one consolidated single dashboard to bring together all that information and effectively delegate amongst teams in order to track cybersecurity progress. So that for the audits that we're performing or the audits that are being performed on our organizations, we're able to maximize the value of what's being delivered. The second big thing that I want to talk about is COVID-2019. So there's been a very exciting refresh of COVID. And the goal behind COVID-2019 is to make COVID as accessible for your organizations as possible. We've added design factors that allow you to customize your COVID experience while capturing all the things that have been widely utilized about COVID-4, 4.1, and COVID-5 around the globe. Uh, this is not just a partnership to advance those COVID capabilities for those of you that have a consulting practice that does rely on COVID, uh, but also to enable COVID execution for organizations that are seeking that. So if your organization is struggling with the ability to put COVID into place, COVID-19 is designed to help make that process easier for you. 
second item to talk about, the Enterprise Training Program. And so this has been a major source of my activity over the course of the, of the last year, is installing Enterprise Training, right? Um, more and more organizations are recognizing that, yes, it's very important to have the right tools in place, but it's extremely critical to have people who know how to use those tools. And this is our ability to expand out not just what's being offered by the London chapter, which is fantastic, but also to delve into new topics, to allow organizations that are seeking certain specific gurus in the industry, and guess what? All those people are able to be found through ISOCA, right? Folks who are not only experts in their subject matter, but are also <coughs> highly vetted and very capable instructors who are able to deliver to your teams. Oops. Sorry. Um, and so uh, in that context, you know, we've seen uh, training that's based on audit, based on cybersecurity, based on assurance, based on IT risk and governance, all the things that do align with our certifications, of course. Um, secondly, we have a lot of role-based design for organizations that say these are the types of individuals that we have on our teams and how do we fulfill what they're looking for. And thirdly, uh, we're able to deliver across geographical barriers, uh, not only virtual but also in person, uh, with a couple mixed ideas uh, in there as well to create a custom plan. And finally, the third item that I'll mention is the cybersecurity training platform, CSX Nexus. And so, uh, just by a show of hands, how many people have heard about the CSX Nexus before? Great. <laughs> Excellent. So if you've taken a look at this platform before, you've been intrigued by it, I want to let you know that there's now over 225 labs available within the platform. Um, it's growing exponentially and we're seeing uptake at many different organizations and on a quarterly basis we're having new content releases in order to ensure that it is as current as it needs to be. Uh, so we're now including things that start from basic scanning uh, for those who are not in a cyber function but want to start heading in that direction, uh, going all the way through vulnerability exploitation, penetration testing, uh, and now gamification and cyber uh, activities so that SOC teams have the ability to compete with each other. And as we know, uh, SOC team members love that, that uh, challenge element, that competition. So with that, um, I'll, I'll open up the floor for any questions before we turn things over to our, our friends at PwC. One, so I'm thrilled actually that Isaac International is reaching out more widely and providing a much broader and deeper product for everyone. And it's also now focused on institutions. Um, the thing that I have found over the past few years is actually almost like a broadening disconnect between what you're trying to do in Chicago and what actually the chapter should be doing two things. One is supporting those initiatives that you're rolling out, but also what support can <coughs> get to do some things locally. What I'm finding through personal experience is that when I try to do both, they clash a little bit and neither one side nor the other is totally clear about what the other's trying driving at and trying to achieve. So how do we overcome that as you roll out even more? Sure. That's a big challenge. I don't know if I have time to, uh, to uh, accomplish that in this brief moment. But what I'll say is we are more in, interested in working with the chapters than ever before. And hopefully my presence is that unfakeable signal. I'm here, guys. Right? I would like to know what I can do to support you. Now, the chapters and international, there will be times at which their ultimate goals differ. But there's going to be a lot of times when those two run along the same channel. Getting more members of ISACA, right? Getting more engagement, putting more tools into your hands. So uh, I would encourage you, reach more out to us, reach out to me, let's have a conversation. Let's get that dialogue going. When there has not been as much attention on the international side as you might like, remember, we are a nonprofit, right? There's only 200 people that sit in Chicago that are part of ISACA, where there's 135,000 members and 220 chapters. The chapters are ISACA. ISACA International is doing what we can to tie these things together. And we are putting more effort, more resources into this than ever before because we are <coughs> receiving that reciprocation from yourselves, like the ability to speak here tonight. Thank you. 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 Thank
the, you have there's a certificate now, cyber security policies. Yes. Uh, which is different from the CISA that we know. So my concern is, uh, are we saying that CISA holder will not be able to hold the cyber uh, environments? Or why are we creating the cyber security audits from the CISA curriculum? Or why are we not managing it together so that the CISA holder will have the capability to deliver that? Yeah. Did you get my question? Yeah, great question, thanks. So the cybersecurity audit certificate is designed specifically for those auditors who are interested in adding cyber to their set of skills. Not every IT auditor is interested in doing that. But for those that are looking to be able to demonstrate it, the cybersecurity audit certificate is built for them. I'll also differentiate it is a certificate, not a certification. So the certification is still the CISA, right? And then the certificate would be the cybersecurity audit certificate, or as we call it, the CSXA, uh, which demonstrates that cybersecurity capability. Does that make sense? Right. If you have a CISA and you're interested in exploring cyber, demonstrating that you have those skills, it's a great way to do it. Chris, I have a brief question for you along these lines as well. We have, you know, right. many of us have heard about CSX fundamentals, of course, and about CSX Nexus, but very few of us have actually seen the platforms or the other things. Are there places we can go to have a look at them online? Yeah, great, thanks. You can absolutely get access to them at isaka.org, but I would also encourage you, grab my card, you can get a personalized demonstration of these tools if going to the website is not, uh, is not sufficient for you. Um, many organizations are looking at that, and to contact me directly, uh, we'd be happy to help you figure out which set of products is gonna be the right fit for what you're looking to do. I thought you were gonna ask me about my jacket. <laughs> later, later. Yeah, Donald's not a fan, nor is my wife, but I like it. Yeah. Everyone, uh, thank you so much for the ability to speak here today. Really honored, appreciate it. Let's get on to the next part of the evening. And for this, we have not one, not two, but three PwC presenters, one of whom is looking very somber here. <laughs> the topics they are going to be discussing are third party assurance, gray IT, or oh, maybe that's about me, and uh, cyber uh, state of the nation. The three people concerned are James Ellis, who's right here, Duncan Page, who is over there waving at me, but not in you yet, and Laura Duncan. Are you trying to run some sort of teamwork thing here? So Duncan Page and then Laura Duncan, who is also standing at the back. Now, which of you is going to go first? It's going to be Laura, I think. Sure. It's going to be Laura. Hi, everybody. Um, so, just wanted to quickly introduce myself. Um, I am a director in our cybersecurity practice, and um, I mainly work uh, in the retail and consumer sector, so uh, I've got a lot of experience there, but I'm old enough and I've worked long enough to um, have worked all across several industries. Um, we got together to kind of think of how we can piecemeal a topic around cybersecurity and there's lots of cool sexy things to talk about, but I thought I'd kind of kick us off by talking about kind of um, the past year what our threat intelligence team has observed or the kind of key trends, uh, key threat actors, and then I thought I'd just talk off the cuff about what several of my clients are doing, what several of their control functions are doing, and what several of their internal and external audit functions are doing. Um, and feel free to ask me questions. I'm not super nerdy and super technical, so if you're trying to trick me, you probably will. Um, but I'm sure Duncan or James could help me out. <laughs> cool, so every year um, we have a threat intelligence team that takes a look back on what has happened in the past year, what we've observed are the kind of key trends, what we see happening all over the world and what we see happening to um, our largest and most important clients and whatnot. So um, I thought I'd just give some highlights from that report and I think that it's on our website if you want to find more but um, hopefully I'll cover most of it. 
So looking back at 2018, and this has continued in 2019, and I can talk about some of the changes and evolutions we've seen. Um, but if I just take a look back at some of the trends that we've seen. Um, previously, attacks were very much uh, targeted at certain physical locations or countries, so the US, the UK, and whatnot. And what we're seeing in the past year and a half is a merging of kind of geopolitical activity. It could be originating anywhere, Ukraine, Russia, China, India, here, everywhere. And it's not targeted at a specific location. So we've seen a lot of kind of cross industry. So what we, I guess the thing to take away from that is all of your key kind of locations are, are up for grabs and in terms of the bad guy's mind. Um, this kind of second thing that we've seen is obviously um, more financially motivated attacks, whereas you've got different kind of threat actors, people, the bad guys after different types of stuff. So they could be after money, um, they could be after just disruption, they could be making a political statement, um, which kind of will be the fourth trend that I'll cover. Um, but, but what we saw mo mainly this year um, by researching the dark web by looking through all the articles and all the breaches and whatnot. Oh, hey, Christine. Um, is the fact that retail and consumer has really been hit hard by financially motivated attacks, um, as well as the hospitality sector. So, the number of um, hotels that I've talked to in the past year has uh, stood out in my mind and my personal experience. Um, and a lot of my retail and consumer customers who obviously hold lots of client data, lots of clients' financial data, um, and have a lot of old legacy systems are the ones that have been targeted the most. And that, that's been the sector to stand out the most and been the most heavily hit from, from our research. Uh, the third would be uh, the bad guys, threat actors, um, using legitimate software to inject their viruses and their malicious codes. So it's no longer some you know, thing that you see in the movies where they take 20 seconds, hack into your systems, and then do some big magical thing. They're actually getting quite smart. They're actually looking at all the software tools that various organizations use. Um, they're very aware of vulnerabilities within those tools, and then they use their knowledge of how to do easy injections of just a few lines of code to get what they need. So, um, and I'll talk about more like what, what clients are doing to counteract that later, but things like the system development lifecycle and making sure that you are testing your code and everything that you're developing, some of the more boring stuff that people don't really find exciting is actually some of the stuff that could be a, a key preventer for these attacks. And last but not least, I'm American, so we all know what I could talk about here, but election hacking was, was another trend that we, we noticed in, in 2018 and continues to be uh, that key non-financial disruptor in the past 12 to 18 months. So just wanted to kind of set the scene for you guys and what we have kind of objectively observed in our own threat intelligence team. So if I talk about a little bit about, let me get my notes out here. Um, if I talk a bit about what are the different threats, what are the different types of ways the bad guys are getting in, the threat actors are actually getting in, um, I'll kind of go through, I've put in the, in the deck some examples so you can go and Google all the bad stories later. I don't want to be like super negative, um, <laughs> but um, there's kind of like four key ways that we've seen threat actors uh, being able to infiltrate companies. And so I'll talk a bit about what those are because they're quite technical. I'll do it in a simple explanation and then I'll talk about kind of the things that I've seen my clients and that I'm recommending to, to people to, to prevent that. So how are the bad things happening? Um, so the first, the first area is, I've got like three mics. I've got this one, I've got this one, whatever. Um, so the first, uh, the first one is around card skimming. So these are all similar in nature, but with different outcomes. Uh, we saw this example. So just to cover what card skimming actually is. So a threat actor is going to somehow infiltrate um, a company's environment. 
And that's actually the easiest thing to do through phishing emails, through um, unprotected networks, unsegregated networks. It, it's quite easy to kind of get in. The problem is in compromising systems and breaching, actually taking data out it is the, the more sophisticated kind of thing that people are doing. And card skimming, what they do is once you're in a system's um, say you get into a system's code of their website, they would inject some sort of software, some sort of code that would actually um, look for payment details and payment card data. And so when a customer goes and enters their payment card data on, I don't know, a website like Ticketmaster, um, that code will actually extract customer client details, payment details, and store that for a threat actor to come and collect later. So this is an example of people taking payment details neither frauding the public or selling your payment details on the dark web for a sum of money. And um, we've got some research that says that over 6,000 websites have been compromised in this way. So card skimming is quite a popular way of obtaining payment details quite easily. And two examples of that would be Ticketmaster and British Airways. Um, if you have heard, if you have ever heard of uh, an attack called, and I'm probably mispronouncing it, so forgive me, but um, Magecart doesn't mean anything. But the reason why that is a specific attack is because this um, software called Magento is the number one e-commerce platform. So what a lot of people use to build their external websites. There are several known vulnerabilities there that weren't patched up on time. And so therefore, um, a lot of threat actors, a lot of bad guys used that and exploited it. And because it's the number one e-commerce platform, once people knew about the vulnerabilities, it was only a question of were people actually going to patch their systems quickly enough? Were they going to come back and actually do anything about to secure that? If not, then they might have resulted in a breach. So. If this uh, software is familiar to you, if this platform is familiar to you, you might want to think about that and ask your tech department what they've done to prevent about some of those vulnerabilities. Um, the other thing is that a lot of software companies, a lot of the jazzy software companies that you buy to get the cool new things, have to spin up quite quickly. And so it's not just one vulnerability, it's multiple. And actually, there's, there's many ways to um, expose a website, expose bad code, and attackers are not often attacking once, they're attacking multiple times. They're able to grow in maturity and grow in sophistication quite quickly. So it's not once, but several times that card skimming becomes an effect for, for some of our victims. So the second really techie term um, is crypto mining. So Crypto mining, again, starts with being able to access a company's um, internal network, some of your actual operational technology, some of your customer-facing websites. And um, they, again, inject a, a script that actually might look for <coughs> cryptocurrencies, so things like Bitcoin and whatnot, um, organizations that are trading off of that. With, with the rise of cryptocurrency, you've had people exploiting that, and it's quite easy because it's a, a new thing. People don't know a lot about cryptocurrency, and people say it's very secure, but threat actors have found a way to expose that and inject code that actually can take some of your common currency and turn it into cryptocurrency and then exploit and, and get money that way. This happened um, in the US. Uh, the ICO and with student loans company. And this kind of crypto jacking has increased by 4,000% this year. So I know these are super technical terms, but I think we're starting to see a trend here of these are just, it, it's quite easy for everybody to get in and then it's a matter of the different methods they use to get certain information out. So if I go to the, the third one, um, business email compromise. A lot of people might um, associate this with phishing and ransomware. 
a, a lower level of sophistication. So um, a threat actor <coughs> emails somebody, it looks like your accounts payable department, you approve something, and then all of a sudden you have paid a, a, a fraudulent company. Um, they're quite sophisticated, making these emails look real. And um, a lot of times they're not using it to get the money, they're using it to get into your system. So you click anything and all of a sudden you, they're on your network and they can ask for privileges. So if we think about, I don't know, IT is often outsourced, the help desks are often outsourced. So you want a new password reset, they might send you a link to reset your password. All of a sudden they can use your credentials to log on to a network and, and easily take what they want from, from that angle. So um, they can also take over your laptop and ask for ransomware and ask for lots of money. So again, um, things around being careful about your emails if you don't know the sender. There's really quick tips and tricks that you can advise your users to do and it's about that cultural advancement of your workforce knowing that these threats are out there and that there's simple things that you can do about them. This happened at um, Pathé, which is a French um, film production company. Um, the FBI says that it's been over $12.5 billion um, that has been lost through business email compromise. So it's, it, it is quite uh, a mature and sophisticated method that's being used these days because it exploits your everyday worker. Last techie thing, I promise. <laughs> um, so the next, the, the fourth and final is around supply chain attacks. And I think this is really relevant, revel, relevant to um, what James is going to talk about today. Um, PwC actually played a very significant hand in discovering this methodology that attackers are using. So if you haven't read our Cloud Hopper report, please, please do. Um, did anybody hear about this NotPetya like scam, anybody? Yes? Okay. So this is what I'm talking about here. So what some threat actors have done is realize that um, some third parties, some quite major third parties, and I won't name them, but you can Google, and I think the U.S. Um, Justice Department has actually released several of the names, so you can go find out who. Um, but uh, attackers have gotten smart with the third parties that people use because common thing is outsourcing now. And instead of attacking a company directly, they attack a third party. And it's a long game. So they will compromise somebody who operates your first, second, or third line of defense. Or it could be support. could be anybody, really, that you outsource to. Um, they find weaknesses and vulnerabilities within their environment. And then we called it Operation Cloud Hopper because they're able to hop from uh, from, from one company that's a provider to your actual systems because the connection is often quite easy to find out. So, you know, if you think about, and I'm trying to remain agnostic of names here, but if you think about big third party providers, of course you have them logged in and, and connected to your systems. And so it was quite easy for threat actors to hack into a, a third party provider and then get access to hundreds upon hundreds of organizations. So um, we've got more in detailed information, but you know, some really large companies were affected by supply chain attacks. So FedEx, WPP, DLA, Piper, Maersk, Recap and Keezer, I could probably go on and on and on and on. 10 billion is not even, in my opinion, the accurate number of what this cost several of our organizations because if you think about Maersk, they're a uh, distribution company, and how many late payments do they have to suffer from? How many late shipments do they have? Um, if you actually think about being taken completely out of business um, for several days, what an organization the size of some of these, what that would actually cost um, is, is very significant. So just to summarize, card skimming, crypto mining, business email compromise, and supply chain attacks are the four different types of attacks that we've monitored um, the most 
in 2018 and going into 2019, that stayed pretty stable. So then I just wanted to talk a little bit about what clients, what my clients are doing, what others in, in industry are doing before I hand over to James and Duncan. Um, so the first part is obviously, this is now hitting a material amount of money. You know, cyber, it used to be quite hard to quantify cyber risk and understand, you know, what is the real risk exposure. Yes, it's very scary. And yes, if the worst scenario happened, um, we don't really care. But then things like GDPR hit and that changed the mood quite significantly. And now Sarbanes-Oxley is even increasing their skepticism over your key cybersecurity controls. And so that is all evolving and becoming more, um, regulators are becoming more stern on this. So I have been a part, and I, I mean, you guys jump in as well. I've been a, a part of several more conversations where people are actually trying to better quantify their cybersecurity risk across their entire landscape. Some of the things that I've actually gone and done is to work with our actuarial team, who are much better at quantifying things than I am, <laughs> and, and actually come up with a mathematical way to, to quantify something as vague as cybersecurity risk, because it's, it, it's not as straightforward. And we've actually worked with them quite a bit to, to develop models with that. Um, and, and these are just four, but there's about a billion things that people are doing. But um, the, the second is the, the smart organizations I've seen are actually really utilizing their internal and external audit functions to monitor and track progress against some of this. So I've had significant, uh, significantly more experience in um, red teaming exercise, if you guys know what that is. So you get the white hat hackers, the good, the good guys that are also very smart and could be very bad if we don't treat them well. Um, if you get those guys to go and kind of expose your vulnerabilities and say, hey, do your best, see what you can get to. Um, and, and, and those have been really interesting. And, and internal and external audit, I think, play a really critical role in kind of giving you milestones. Um, so I've been a, a much bigger part of external and internal audit planning and budgeting to kind of better monitor and track this and get a better understanding of risk and controls. Um, the, the third one, and, and one of the most important, which again, James will talk about shortly, is, is more accountability to third parties and holding the third parties more to account. You know, we're all in a cost cutting, cost reduction kind of world right now, and it's about making sure that, yes, okay, if you want to completely outsource a function or, or offload a function, um, that's great, but how much do you trust the people that you're leaving with that function? Um, you know, several people outsource an accounts payable department. Well, that's literally the final stop of your money leaving your, your bank accounts. <laughs> it's a pretty critical thing. Um, your IT function, that's actually the keys to the kingdom. How much do you hold your third parties to accounts? Um, and raise your hand if I, you don't know anything that I'm like talking about, but, um, you know, these SOC reports that that third parties have to do, PwC does those. Um, those are coming over under a lot more scrutiny um, with clients that I've seen. And, and the testing that third parties have to provide to uh, the people who are using them <coughs> has really, really increased. Um, but the fourth and final thing, and this will probably tie into what Duncan's going to talk about later, is getting the basics right. And that starts with knowing what you have. Um, and Duncan's going to be talking about gray IT later. If you don't know what you own and what is actually operating on your network, you don't really know what you need to be protecting. You don't know your boundaries. And now we have these really cool buzzwords and initiatives like cloud computing, which is the sexiest thing that anybody's ever heard in a decade. And nobody really knows what exactly that entails. But um, you have this now kind of like boundless network and environment. You don't really know, you know, does your data actually sit in a building anymore? No, it sits in somebody else's that might subcontract to somebody else that might actually be located in a country you don't even operate in. And, you know, you, you, you have these confusing things. So a lot of my, my clients and the, the places where I, I visit are 
really focusing on understanding what exactly they own, who they use, and, and how it's being used. So that is the first step in getting the basics right. And then, you know, the, the solution to preventing yourself against so many of these things is not like this great tool that's going to end all, be all, fix everything. It's often like the really boring stuff that nobody wants to invest in, like patching. Like that is like such a huge deal. And nobody really cares about that because it sounds like such a boring thing and it's very arduous. Or, you know, making sure that in your testing cycles, code is actually properly tested and <laughs> secure before it goes into production. Who knew that that could be actually a really good idea? And the other one is this thing. Remember, cloud is outsourcing. Yes, it is yeah. Not, it is not a wonderful new uh, yeah. piece of equipment. It is outsourcing. Yeah. Cloud doesn't mean you're that closer to heaven because you're in the cloud. It actually just means that it's no longer within a building that you own and, and whatnot. So. So th those are the things that, you know, it kind of goes back to the basics of IT general controls and, and normal things. And as we become more complex, the very basics and the very fundamentals are what we have to get right. So um, I don't, there, there are some tools that kind of allow you to expedite that process and to, you know, find things out more. But, you know, good processes, good people, Establishing a security culture where people actually understand what they're doing when they're logging onto all these systems and approving things by email and on their phone and text messages and voicemails and whatnot, what that actually means um, your company is taking on from a risk perspective. So I don't know if you guys have any questions, but I just thought I'd canter through what we've seen in the past year. And thank you very much for having me. Do you need this? So, okay, so um, I'll just give you a quick intro to myself. Um, so I think uh, having joined PwC relatively recently, um, I've actually spent most of the last few years working in regulation, in financial services regulation. So if you thought that Laura's talk was terrifying, I'm about to talk to you for 25 minutes about banking regulation. So it can get more scary. Um, what that means is that, for me, there's probably a lot of you sitting in here thinking, okay, I don't work in financial services, or I don't work in a regulated firm, is this going to be relevant? I think so. I think for two reasons. One, because actually what we're seeing now is the regulator pushing us in a new direction to go and look at things that the industry wasn't thinking about before, and the stats I'll show you in a minute will evidence that. And the second thing is that I think now um, we are looking at an environment where all of us have got to think about regulation, whether that's GDPR or whether that's the NIS directive. In cyber, we're all moving towards a point where we need to be thinking about how we're being regulated and who our regulators are. Um, so what do I mean by operational resilience and the cloud? Um, I figured I'll start with an example. So. You're going to have to use your imagination for this, but imagine that I'm the CISO of Resilience Credit. I know that's difficult, but let's just run with it. Um, so we're a great credit card company, millennials love us. We've got uh, over a million customers. We've had to use cloud uh, because it's the only way we could ramp up so quickly. And so far, everything's been absolutely fantastic. Everyone's really happy. So I'm walking in Monday morning. My head of operations gives me a call. That's not good. She says to me, We've lost access to our databases and our systems. Nothing's going through. Our call center is absolutely swamped. We've got thousands of people on the phone. They can't buy their coffees. They're absolutely furious. If we don't get this sorted out, the CEO is going to have to cancel his golf trip. So what do I do? OK, hopefully a couple of you are in cyber. If I'm the CISO, I want to know what's happening in my network. Who's the first person I call? Someone give me something. Any guesses? OK, crisis management. I'm going to go broader than that. SOC. SOC. Thank you, sir. So I'm going to ring my head of SOC. Now, he's a very nice chap, Dutch man. Um, now, again, as I said, we went to cloud. We've got, with a vendor, a solution that does all of our monitoring on the network. 
fully integrated solution, best in class. So I say to him, look, I need to know what's happening. Why are my systems offline? He says, oh, actually, I can't get through to our monitoring provider. They're not picking up my calls. We can't log into the platform. I've got no idea what's going on. But you know, give me a couple of hours, and I'll let you know. So at this point, right, yeah, we're in crisis management now. So I'm going to my crisis management team. I ring them up. I say, hey, what's happening in incident response? What are you guys doing? You, you must be investigating, surely. And he says, uh, yeah, OK, I, I can start looking at this. But uh, weirdly, our ticketing system's gone down. So I'm really struggling. And also, I know that the uh, monitoring system's gone down. So I've actually been looking at that. So OK, he's working on it. At this point, I'm a bit puzzled. Because how is it that my entire business has just collapsed? Well, don't worry, because I've got a great source of information. Keith on Twitter. My personal phone lights up, and he says, hey, have you seen all of the big cloud meltdown stuff? And I think, no. So I open up my phone. Oh, this hashtag's going absolutely crazy. The biggest cloud provider in the UK, big cloud, seems to have gone. Nothing's happening. Now, what I want to do at this point, and this is where my background in GRC starts to strike me, I want to go to my governance, risk, and compliance head to say, OK, well, if we now know that that's what the problem is, because we're guessing that's what the problem is, how are we affected? You know, which of our systems are gone? Which of our systems can we access? What's happened? So I call up my head of GRC. And she says, oh, big cloud. I have absolutely no idea. I say, oh, OK. So I guess that means that it could be impacting all of our systems. I have absolutely no idea. So that was great. There's a, there's a kind of example for me of, uh, I'll call that a doomsday scenario. Um, so, OK, so let's bring it back to the regulatory thing that I promised you, and I know you're very excited about, is what, what is the FCA saying about all of this? Well, they're saying, what causes incidents? What do they care about? So number one, unsurprisingly, change management. Uh, I don't know if anyone here works for TSB. <laughs> you may have heard about a couple of incidents they had. Um, so, and then, you know, for me working in cyber, we sit there and think, okay, well, the second thing has got to be the cyber attacks, right? All of the hackers we've just been talking about with their special techniques and all the rest of it. So, when the FCA published their survey on regulated firms as to what caused incidents last year, the second cause was third parties. So 15% of all the incidents reported to the FCA actually came from third parties. And then, third of all, we're down to software application issues. And actually, cyber attacks doesn't appear until number four. And then we've got other things like hardware issues, uh, human error. But the point is, is that third parties are actually the second biggest problem for regulated firms. So I think then we have to ask ourselves a couple of questions. Right? which is, what do we know about our third parties and how much effort have we put into figuring out what this worst case scenario actually is? So I think, uh, sorry, I, I didn't catch your name, madam. <laughs> Siobhan. Siobhan. So I think you raised a really good point, right, which is where cloud sounds fantastic. And we think, OK, this is going to help us accelerate our growth and we're going to get everything up and running. But ultimately, it comes back to a definition I heard about five years ago, which was instead of cloud, we should just call it somebody else's computer. Yeah. Yeah. Because ultimately, that's all it boils down to at the end of the day. Um, now, I think there is a lot to be said for cloud in the general sense, right? Because you can spend all day trying to you know, write your own code and secure your own products. There are vendors out there who've got very scalable, very secure solutions. And you can embrace that and get a lot from it. But having said that, we should be understanding exactly what we're doing. And from the FCA's perspective, suddenly we've got a bit of a problem. Because if there's, let's say that you know, Azure and AWS are two of the biggest cloud solutions, how much of the UK banking environment is ultimately reliant on, say, Azure? Now, it could be a little bit. It could be a lot. The fact is, is that most of us 
don't know. So I suppose the, the image I have in my head is that Jeff Bezos is wandering through his AWS data center one day, and he thinks, oh, I wonder what that big red button is for. And he goes over and he pushes it. And then suddenly the whole world shut down. You know, planes are falling out the sky, and you know, people are running through the streets screaming. Teslas are crashing into the central reservations. Um, I hope I haven't alarmed anyone too much, but you know, let's, let's just say that it's unlikely. Um, and, and I suppose factoring into what Duncan's going to talk about as well is that we're kind of at a point now where it's very easy to buy a cloud solution. So if you're working in, say, procurement or sales or ops, well, you know, don't get IT to go and build something and then they've got six months of approvals and then you need to procure the hardware and then there's no room in the data center and we don't have enough RAM, so come back next year. And you think, well, I can just go to Bob down the road who sells me a fully packaged solution and it's up and running and we've got customer data on it and cyber are the absolute last people to find out because they don't find out until everything's broken. So... Funnily enough, actually, on that note, I was at a barbecue uh, last weekend and I was chatting with someone who works in HR at a FTSE 250. And I mentioned that I worked in cyber and she said, oh, yeah, she said, no, we're very careful with all of that. said, all of our data goes straight onto Dropbox. <laughs> so I'll pass you her details. I'm sure we can do some work. <laughs> um, so anyway, I suppose the question at this point is, what should we be thinking about? So this is, this is what the FCA pulled together. So bearing in mind that, that we've just been saying that it's the second biggest cause of incidents, you would like to think that it's very thoroughly catered for and that we've got nothing to worry about. Well, no, unfortunately not. So we're coming back to our point earlier. Half of firms do not maintain a comprehensive list of all the third parties with whom they do business and which access their systems and data. So, and again, if you, if you want to read this in more detail, it's the FCA uh, Operational Resilience Survey that's on their website. Um, it's, it's well worth reading if you're interested in this. Um, I, I think this is particularly scary for me because we're talking about regulated firms here who know that the FCA is interested. They know that this is a hot topic and yet this is what they're reporting back. So half of them don't even know who their third parties are. Then, if an incident does strike, we've only got 59% of small firms that actually know what their third parties are going to do to respond. So if an incident strikes, do you know what they're going to do? Do you know if they have response? Do you know if they have a capability to restore their services within the window? My view is that they don't. And then, finally, we get to the very last bit of when a crisis does strike and you invoke your C-certs and your crisis management teams and all the rest of it, are you actually working with your third parties when you're doing the testing to figure out whether they fit in, whether they can respond, whether you can... Because if you're reliant on this for critical business processes, then if you haven't tested with your third parties, then how can you possibly know that you're going to be able to get these systems back online? So... The FCA has looked at all of this data, talked about how they're very concerned, and I think with the understatement of the year, they said, we are disappointed with these responses. <laughs> I would think so. I'm disappointed because I'm a customer of these people. Let alone regulating them. Um, anyway, so I think I've filled you with doom and gloom for far too long. Um, so I was going to talk a little bit about what we should be doing. So again, I'm heavily biased by being from a GRC background, so if you're not part of governance or risk or compliance or audit or any of these things, you, you'll probably be thinking that this isn't my problem, but I think all of us have got something to do. So this first point here, who will own third-party risk management? Um, there's actually a very good paper on this topic that was co-authored by... Uh, UK Finance and uh, KPMG, I believe, um, which was talking about how TPRM has become a bit outmoded in the, and again, we're coming back to the point we were discussing earlier, where at one point, your third parties, and as I say, in this I include everyone, whether you're a, an obvious cloud provider like an Azure, or a not so obvious one like a Salesforce, or you know, any kind of hosted solution, 
is, you know, are procurement actually the best area to be looking after third-party risk management? If we're talking about keeping costs down, if we're talking about making sure that they've got the right SLAs in place, well, perhaps, but procurement don't own the business processes. So if we go back to our example of Resilience Credit Limited, if my credit card transactions are completely reliant on a customer database that's hosted somewhere else, then do I trust procurement to make sure that they've got the right cyber controls, that they've got the right uh, recovery controls, that they've got the right resilience controls? Now, they are actually seeing a massive increase in the number of firms that are pushing third-party risk management under the business and saying that irrespective of how involved they want to get, they now own it. And if things go wrong, then that's their problem. My view is that where it's hosted isn't necessarily the problem and who owns it isn't necessarily the problem. The key is, is that you've got the right inputs. So your business are going in and saying, this is our uh, acceptable interruption window. This is how long we can have to restore services. And that you're following that through with your cyber, with your BCP and with your IT and that everyone's on the same page. And ideally that all of it is documented. I think the key point to me is that as I said, cloud is someone else's computer. So where your service is hosted is really not important. If you want to host it on your own Windows server in your own data, se in your own data center, great. If you want to host it on Azure, also great. But it doesn't change the fact that you're responsible for making sure that it's fit for purpose. Um, an event I was at recently was discussing an anecdote where the German regulator was expressing concern that certain financial institutions were using cloud as, quote, um, an excuse, no, a refusal to be regulated was how they termed it, on the basis that they would come in and say, okay, can you give me all of your server IPs and tell me when they were last vulnerability scanned, when they were patched? And they would say, yes, of course, this is our internal estate, these are all the patching dates, oh, and then everything else is in the cloud. We don't know. So, it, so I guess that, that sort of follows on to my next point, really, which is that which, whichever part of the business we're in, whether we're, whether we're in first line of defense, whether we're in GRC, whether we're in risk, whether we're in audit, we should be asking those difficult questions. So if a vendor comes along and says, yes, this is a great solution, it's going to fit you really well, um, we should be going and asking them, okay, well, which, which operating system are you running on? Is it server 2003? Is it server NT? Is it, you know, a NAS unit that someone borrowed off of their grandma? Um, we should be asking those questions. If they can't tell us what patching cycle they're on, why can't they tell us? If they can't tell us what they're using to scan for vulnerabilities, why can't they tell us? And my view, and something that you'll see, again, with the, uh, certainly with UK finance, when, they were when they're looking at cloud at the moment, is that we should all be trying to talk the same language. So if cloud providers want us to buy their services, then they should be able to provide us with that level of confidence, whether that's through an audit report or directly answering our questions. But we shouldn't be trying to figure it out. Or worst of all, saying, well, we couldn't find out, so we're just going to assume everything's OK. Um, so I guess that brings me on to my, my final point, really, which is that I think Yes, cloud is a positive thing in general. It allows us to increase our scalability. It allows us to increase our level of control. Um, but I would be very concerned if these questions aren't being asked. So do we know who our third parties are? And that includes everybody. That includes our third parties and our third parties' third parties. You know, so it's all well and good that you're showing me this lovely dashboard but is that actually reliant on a hosting company in another country with a completely different set of controls to the ones that you've described to us? Do we know which of our third parties we're reliant on? Yeah, there'll be a lot of third parties out there that are in the estate. I think, you know, I think when the FCA last looked at it, uh, you know, there were you know, tens of thousands at some banks. So we know there's going to be a lot, but which of those are critical business processes? Which of those are the ones that we absolutely cannot afford to go down for more than a short window? And then that next point, do we know who our third parties rely on? Are they reliant on a specific data center or are they reliant on a different third party? 
Again, that should be information they're willing to share. And finally, that point there, if a disaster strikes, what will be impacted and what will we do? So if Amazon goes down, which systems are we going to lose? How long do we have to get them on board? Do we have a backup solution that isn't just waiting for the cloud provider to come back? Have we tested restoring systems with them? Do we know that we can restore systems in collaboration with them? Or are we going to have you know, 15 hours of phone calls between two teams who've never spoken to each other before? I think the key point to me is that when we think about the level of reliance that most companies are now placing on cloud, in 2019, the answer to those four questions, whatever it is, the answer must not be no. And on that point, I will leave you. Thank you very much. OK, grey IT between you and drinks. So uh, for hopefully uh, what I'm going to briefly go through will tie in with some of the other topics you've heard. Uh, but fortunately, I also only have five slides, so uh, I think that's appropriate to the, to the hour. Okay, so the brackets return of uh, grey IT risk. Um, so I'm Duncan Page. I'm a director in PwC uh, Cybersecurity. I'm actually a technology guy from the energy sector, uh, but through the consultancy magic of working on what customers want to buy, uh, I've spent uh, the last little while, last couple of years, actually working on risk and compliance type programs, including a lot of grey IT. And through those efforts, I think we've identified risk assessed and processed several thousand items of grey IT uh, across different clients. So hopefully I've got a few observations uh, for that. It's called the return of grey IT. I'm not sure grey IT ever really went away, uh, but there are some factors that make it particularly uh, topical at the moment. Okay, most presentations start with a definition of some kind. So let's just build this out. Um, actually, I think grey IT has probably got one definition, but a number of different names. So uh, it can be grey IT, shadow IT, business IT. Most recently, I've come across lightly managed IT, which is almost, almost poetic, I think, as a, as a euphemism. So um, whatever you call it, it's really IT which is you know, purchased, operated, uh, et cetera, outside of the control uh, of your IT function, or, or at least having very little involvement of your IT function. And where this comes up, it's normally done in the name of factors such as speed and agility, or a, I simply dislike my IT department intensely. Um, so people have reasons for doing this in a business, and there can be some advantages. There are also some common disadvantages, and I put a few examples here. So we could end up being a bit light on our normal level of procurement, discipline, and control. Equally around architecture, discipline, and control, does this stuff even fit in? And moving towards the risk area, um, there's no real guarantee that we'll get security and compliance by design, if the designer did not have that in mind. So probably then insufficient IT and security controls is a risk. And if I've got insufficient controls, I'm pretty unlikely to have adequate assurance over, over those controls. So there are some potential disadvantages to this. Um, in terms of what's new and why this is topical, Okay, so I think the thing that's new is today's environment allows grey IT to be acquired more easily than ever and to accumulate risk even faster than it can be acquired because of changes in the environment. So through cloud and related trends, it's never been easier to go out and buy a business application, even if you've got very little IT knowledge yourself, and very little linkage with IT infrastructure and the, and the rest of the environment around you. So it's very easy to go and get business applications now. And the, the, the origins of grey IT used to be little systems being developed to plug little gaps, typically. But of course now on the cloud, you can buy any shape or size of application. So you could be using Dropbox uh, for in a way which is maybe not appropriate to the business data concern, but that's quite a small thing. 
Uh, but equally, you can go and buy a Salesforce or an SAP. So you can buy an awful lot of functionality, which previously there would be no way of acquiring without mainline IT. But now, uh, under the right circumstances, you can go and get it. And more functionality means the systems you're acquiring as great IT are more likely to become business critical. So you've got that area of risk. And the third topical factor I would point out is we're all aware that regulations surrounding the use of information systems are becoming ever tighter. That's a real problem in the grey IT space. So let's say we have an unregistered system that loses a bunch of sensitive personal data. So you declare the incident, you're in trouble with the regulator for whatever incident and damage has happened. But in the case of your unregistered system, you've got no way of demonstrating any management control or effort you've put in towards protecting that data. So I would argue you're in even more trouble than if that incident had occurred with a properly managed system. So there can be some, some real exposure. So let's have a look at what uh, grey IT is and where we find it. And my strap line here is, you know, if you go looking hard, it turns out your business data is pretty much going everywhere, whether you knew it or not. And this is a real zoo, right? The, the, there are so many different types of application in different locations where your business data can end up. And you may well find that you have very different levels of ownership and responsibility or influence over those places and those systems. So my first two little icons for on-premise and desktop, this is really the origins of grey IT. It's people locally developing or installing stuff, or maybe developing standard office applications, a, a, a bit more automation, and sensitive data, a bit more sharing, um, and suddenly these become risky applications. So that's where it started. Uh, but just look at all the other places uh, we're looking at now. So we've already said quite a bit on cloud. It can be a very small system, uh, but can be an enormous system quite easily acquired. We're seeing now applications being manifested on other platforms like mobile devices. Often there's a cloud sat somewhere behind them, uh, handling the data backwards and forwards. And lots of different models by which businesses get things done. So on the outsourcing thing you mentioned before, uh, you can outsource entire business functions, or you can just buy business services which happen to come with a system that makes accessing that service you know, easier, you know, uh, easier for you to perform. That is your business data disappearing into someone else's system in a slightly different flavour. And often things like BPOs are purchased on the basis of a business need, and what you're really putting in place historically is a business services contract may not have an IT schedule at all, it may not have a security services schedule, you may be lacking essential items such as data processing agreements because it's really been a business-led purchase. So these ancillary systems appearing in business uh, arrangements are actually quite a fee, as if that wasn't enough. So we're also discovering there are some portals which you're really obliged to use depending on which industry you're in. So some regulated industries, such as energy, have to report various things to government and regulators, maybe to tax authorities. So these are governmental institutions regulated. You don't have any control over but you have to put your business data into them. So you've got no real influence. You may still want to exert access control over who in your organization can do these things. But if they're not on your list, you've got you know, a chance of doing that. At a practical level, you know, if you interact with a banking system, you're probably going to use the tools that they give their customers. So again, in theory, you have a choice, but in practical terms, there probably isn't a choice to use those. Um, so quite a few discoveries there. Another biggie is real estate systems. So an awful lot of IT connected with physical premises. Uh, most companies these days are not their own landlords, so it's probably someone else's building. But we have door entry systems, we have CCTV systems, we have systems associated with <coughs> environmental control, etc. in the building. And if you take the example of CCTV, under the general data protection regulation, anything you capture digitally is likely to be covered <coughs> by that regulation. 
you have to be very careful on your controls, very careful where you point those cameras. You need to have the right signage, etc. So if those systems are propping up in an uncontrolled way, again, potential exposure. And generally, when you contract people to do these things for you, you're not generally transferring your regulatory risk to someone else. You still have it. And a couple more then. Um, there's a trend for what we commonly call uh, Internet of Things applications. So applications that depend for their function on sets of distributed devices. And this could be used in an engineering context. It could be for vehicle tracking, some application like that, uh, where if we're not careful, we're actually tracking the personal details of the people driving around. Um, also come across quite a few more isolated examples like medical devices which you just strap to a laptop and it's got very sensitive personal data just sat there on a laptop. So pretty easy to get this wrong. And lastly, a, a major energy client. Um, this is a bit of a slipping down the sofa, back of the sofa category. So I'm not talking about the hardcore operational technology that would run a power station. But there's all sorts of ancillary systems that operate in that space. And the danger here is, they get developed, they're not on the CIO's asset register, they're not on the process control domain asset register, uh, they're on no one's register, but because of where they are, the, like, the strong likelihood is you're going to become uh, dependent on this. So, one of my strongest messages is just a massive variety of what grey IT can be. So here's the, here's the say what, and I've got this in two halves. Firstly, before I go on to risk, I think grey IT is really an IT problem. i just expand this. Grey IT could be the result of individual actions, or it could be something systematic, and very, very often, the presence of significant amounts of grey IT is some evidence that business and IT are not playing well together some kind of underlying problem. IT seems too slow, too expensive, too tied up in red tape and pesky things like controls. Um, so I think it's important, you know, looking at a given situation to actually work out what the problem is. And then even when you decide to tolerate some grey IT, that can be a problem. There's some real conflicts with the kind of roles you get in IT. You might regard grey IT as a business caused issue with them being lazy but it's people in IT that deal with the consequences. So you get a disjoint between who's got the benefit and who's dealing with the consequences of it. Um, and it can be quite difficult to adopt grey IT because it just might not fit into any category that you normally manage. So I think if you want to try and address and solve grey IT in the business, I think the first place to start is to understand what is the IT and business issue that's causing it to happen. And I have seen some clients in relation to the first bullet point where the amount of grey IT is quite staggering and it can be, for example, 25% of your overall estate by a number of applications, probably not the largest ones, but by a number of applications, can be quite significant. So if we move on to what does this mean for risk, I think this is probably pretty standard, actually. Um, we attract risk because systems are vulnerable um, to cyber incidents. And grey IT has a deserved reputation for often being weak in terms of vulnerability. I would tend to say, until you look, it's more a case of unknown vulnerability. If someone uh, creates a new system on the Amazon cloud, ticks all of the sensible boxes and configurations for security, they've probably built something with lower vulnerability than anything back in IT. But the fact is, until you look, you don't know, and it could be there's absolutely no vulnerability protection at all. So it's an unknown quantity. And just as with any application, you want to understand what is the business criticality of this? What would damage my business if I could no longer rely on this system? And based on the data that's inside and the processing activities, what legal and regulatory risks am I exposed to through having this, this application? So really, no difference to any general IT situation. Uh, and what you require is some kind of, having understood the problem, 
some kind of proportionate risk-based response uh, to the challenge. So if we have a quick look at what the, the bare bones of a, a response to grey IT could include. And I've kept this, by the way, in, entirely generic. It doesn't relate to any particular framework or method. Could well be that there's a, a COVID light IT method. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but from my experience, the very basic steps are you've got to be able to identify the grey IT in order that you can accurately register that on an appropriate asset register, because that's really going to drive what happens next. Um, we need some kind of proportionate way of assessing risk, and your volume could be very high. So it needs to be a balance between something that's quick and easy to do, but also something which asks enough searching questions. It's actually going to tease out the cases you need to look at in more detail. So I've got some of the common outcomes that could arise from risk assessing grey IT. Uh, we tend to see quite a lot of blocking. So these are systems which, when you look, turn out to be just not allowed. And it could be something that's outside acceptable use policy. It could be something you purchase on the internet related to a site where your threat intelligence says this is associated with bad actors, malware activity, etc. So it could just be depending on you know, what source of information you're using for intelligence, you could just conclude not having this at all. Um, at the other end of the scale, you could just decide, okay, this is low risk, I'm going to tolerate it. I'm going to leave this grey IT in the business. No controls needed at this stage. I'm, on the assurance side, I might decide to come back in a year's time or two years' time, see if anything's changed. Beyond that, you could decide this at risk not enough that you actually need to disrupt the business. So you can retain the application in the business, but maybe there's some basic controls you're going to apply to your grey IT. Um, and when I talk about grey IT controls, I'm not talking about the full COVID, the full ISO, or any of the comprehensive frameworks. Probably something that's a little bit closer to cyber essentials in nature. So it is just control the access, control the data lifecycle, do the basic patching, back it up. Etc. Um, so you can decide to leave grey IT where it is, but subject to some basic control. That can be a challenge because business environments are not normally IT controlled environments. So it has to be something that is capable of being done. And you probably want, from the assurance point of view, you'll probably want to show some curiosity and come back and check. The next common outcome we find is, okay, this is a valid business requirement that's being served by this application. However, it's got sensitive personal data in it. It's storing important company group records. Uh, it's externally accessible to a wide audience that prevents the, prevents the threat. So beyond a certain threshold, there's normally a rule that says that this, this can remain, but not in the form of gray IT. So you'll need some kind of adoption process to move the gray IT in some form into proper IT management. So whichever way you look at these frameworks is normally that threshold to be recognized in there somewhere. And the last one is just retire the application. So when you actually start applying discipline and rigor in this type of framework, very common outcome is when you actually put it to people what the cost of keeping the company safe is, uh, they actually say, well, I can use this instead. That's already managed by IT. So, uh, you tend to get a very high proportion of retirement, especially if you're doing quite a backwards-looking program on you know, covering the sins of the past. <coughs> so I just wanted to emphasize a couple of things on this. Um, the, the, the first one is at the front end of the process. So this is really a question of good gatekeeping and understanding how gatekeeping works for the IT environment, and ideally, you would have people like IT managers or IT portfolio managers acting very much in concert with IT contracting and procurement type people to make sure that it's difficult for people in the business to identify a requirement and actually proceed with that requirement for a new system without having validated that requirement with IT. It's very, very common for a new requirement to come up which duplicates something you already have. Incredibly common. So you want to make sure you have that control, otherwise you're doing something pointless in the first place. But you also want to make it very difficult. Most of these new items of grey IT involve a purchase of some kind. You 
you want to make it very difficult for the purchase of uh, information systems or related services to be made without a control point. Um, and I think if you can get that right, and it's really an interplay of the people I've got here, the actors, the business, the whoever's at the front door of IT and, and whoever's doing contracting and procurement, maybe they're the same people. Um, but it's really a business change, business awareness challenge. The policy would then say is unacceptable later. Uh, and because business there, I think IT and contracting and procurement, quite finite groups of people, quite easy to identify, you can get to them easily. Maybe quite a few people in the business have a hand in identifying business requirements. So potentially you've got an awareness and a change issue affecting a large audience. So I think it's important not to just vanish straight into risk management and controls with these. But then of course we will. Um, and the kind of things we're looking for here, I think I've mentioned proportion of framework before. It needs to be something that fits the risk and um, it, you know, doesn't, doesn't uh, introduce too much burden. I think very importantly, when you design a framework, you should reflect that probably the majority of the cases you're going to come across are third party dependent in some way, tying in with what we've heard earlier. So your approach to controls, what you're looking for by way of evidence, assurance products, you really need to wait you know, understand how it is going to apply to third parties because that could be the majority of the time uh, that you're dealing with them. Um, and as I said before, if there's too much risk, then you need to abandon the grey IT approach if you want to stay safe. I'm thinking of the time, so I'm going to go to my last slide. And this is slightly post-rationalised from the last couple of years, but. Um, the conclusions I draw on if you want to get serious about grey IT risk management. So number one, please take the time to understand what the problem actually is. And that's not just what grey IT items can you identify, but it's you know, how did they come about in the first place? What are the key themes of risk that I'd be worried about given what's happened? Secondly, as I mentioned, is to pay attention to the gatekeeping at the front and the detection. Uh, and if you don't feel you can fully achieve the right behaviours, you may be looking at automated detection of cloud systems or installed software, or uh, these days through your card clearing partners, you can get some reasonable intelligence on spend breakdown. Um, so it could be automated as well as through change of behaviour. But let's make sure we're getting the right stuff through the front door. And I think if I as I look at future projects, I would really be placing emphasis with clients to spend, put some time and attention on the first two before moving on. Um, once you've done that then, create your proportionate risk framework. And if you have decided as an organization with some gray IT you're going to tolerate, make sure that you can assess and control that gray IT at acceptable risk, but without introducing too much new burden and cost, which would sort of weigh against any advantages that lightweight IT would have in the first place. So keep it proportionate. And I think if you've done all of the first three, you've then got the ability to enforce with some teeth and consequence you know, what should happen when you do determine that there's an unacceptably risky grey IT in the environment. And if there's another lesson I've learned during a few years of risk and compliance, um, running this type of Program is not guaranteed to make you uh, popular at point. Um, so please help yourselves. Uh, follow these ideas. Don't start with number four. Okay, that's me. Thanks. How the cloud vendor exactly performing that we are testing? Do they shut it down the primary side? Or how do they do the DR testing, such security testing, or anyone. Oh, how are they doing? Various forms of testing. Such security testing. Well, it depends. It with also the depends on how much storing. Uh, you know, there's different ways of doing cloud as well. Yeah. It depends on how the database is structured and where they're storing yeah, I mean, it. If, how. If you're sending data to Google, you're probably writing to eight data centers at once. So it's a good question. I'm not sure how they take pause and test that from time to time. They usually do what most of us do, which is they sample something, and then they say, well, this applies to everything else, because operationally, it should 
be the same across yeah. everything else. So we'll pick one thing and do that. Specifically, the winner, like a major winner, like a AWS, I'm sure, um, they exactly performed at the other things. Really, it's not clear. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's part of the problem in a way. Is is, is that is that generally the bigger that the you know the bigger that these organisations get, the more complex it is to perform proper testing, right? Because in an, in an ideal world, we as IT might like to go in and do a full blown uh, you know BCP test and say, right, everyone's turfed out of the office. And you can imagine going into a bank and saying, we're going to shut down the trading floors and see what happens because we're ninety percent sure that services will resume. The business tends to say no. So, you know, I think we've got a similar problem there. And, it, and, it, and it, so, it, in answer to your question, no, I don't think we can say with any certainty, oh, this is exactly what would happen. But I think that if you're a, you know, if you're purchasing these systems on a large scale, you would you would want to think that at the very least you'd be able to have a desktop run through and say, well, if you're if one of your data sets goes down, what does that look like for us? If your main hub goes down, what does that look like? If our system is compromised and we have to go back to you know, yesterday's data, what does that look like? And so you should be able to go through those scenarios and step by step go through and see does that map with what we're doing and back to Laura's point. That, that's what it comes down to is does your process fit my process? And does your quality standard meet my quality standard? Because yeah, there, there isn't there isn't a one size fits all of yes they you know they've got a hot side therefore everything's great. Um, I don't I don't think you can ever get a, a crystal clear answer in that way. Thank you. Too many layers of virtualization. Yeah. <laughs> these days. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question, but the dilemma has already been addressed, which is about pulling the plug and seeing what happens. I have not seen the business I want to do that. <laughs> This, the question is uh, for shadow IT. Uh, you can say user developed applications or user controlled applications can be called as a gray IT. And uh, the example that like users has designed for some spreadsheets with macros or some calculations or something like that, which is probably yeah. not be the, their day to day work for yeah. the users. This tends to be the kind of area where your policy and framework is never quite complete. Um, there, there are some things that are very definitely business applications, and then when you get to the smaller end, you've got this question of is it, does it count or not? It's just like a spreadsheet yeah. somebody designed for the day to day price calculations or something like I mean, that. With some macros. Yeah, it, it, so. if someone's put a lot of automation in, if they've uh, shared it widely. If they're using it in the chain of processing for their financial statements, if it's SOX relevant, you know, there are, it tends to be a combination of factors that might promote something that's just a spreadsheet and thinking actually. Um, I mean, oftentimes you might say, well, I need to control this as an application, but it is, the, the, the accompanying question is, should this even be an, an application in this form at all? Um, but it, it's, a, it's a very good question. We get similar questions around when does my SharePoint become an application? So I've got publication control is my main control for putting company content on SharePoint. But as you add in automation, you may cross the threshold that now it's an application. Similarly for something like Power BI for data, you know, analytics, if you're just sh using it to share some data in an authorized way with colleagues, probably you'll, you can just have a publication control on the whole platform that works. But as you build more automation, at some point you may cross the threshold, and it's the kind of thing we keep coming across new examples and keep having to add more rules to the playbook as to you know what's an what's an application. Yeah, so it is, it's a tricky tricky area to finish. Yeah, I think that is like if you build a small spreadsheet with the price calculation, or some of the macros is not accurate, then. Your business is a critical, it may be lost a million somewhere. Well, I, I, yeah. think, I think anything that you depend on, critically for your business, needs to be needs to be risk managed. Yeah, we and do like single points of failure, so we'll look at a process like, if this was broken, could you not do this key business process? What's um, a key control? What's a key operational thing? It doesn't matter if it's 
can ask people that like have this beautiful system and it's gorgeous and it's like all complex and invested. And then they download the report to a spreadsheet, manipulate it, and then send it out. And it's like, well, oh, okay. Now that spreadsheet becomes the key yeah. part of that process and you know, you've got to have certain controls over that. So I think it's the amount of reliance you have on like Duncan said, if it's a single point of failure, if it's a key control or if it's a key operational type of activity that's if manipulated could cause whatever kind of risk you're looking at, financial, operational, reputational, kind of type stuff. Yeah. No, no real substitute for common sense, unfortunately, I think, in that area. Um, my question. Please. 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 It's a bit like the old days with IBM, um, cable and wireless, BT. It was take it or leave it. Only the big boys can guarantee this that um, I'm paying an awful lot of money can get the services you're talking about. In one of your earlier slides, you were talking about the fact that only 22% of the smaller companies had the amount of knowledge they need. How were the smaller boys going to be able to actually make the cloud providers do the right thing. Let's just start with that one. <laughs> well, I suppose seeing as it was, <laughs> seeing as it was uh, my slide, I suppose I should take, it, yeah, take the first hit on that. No, I think it's a very good question and it's, and it's something that I guess I'm thinking about from the other side of the equation, which was sitting in a global bank. When clients come to you and ask you questions, well, you know, how much time do you afford answering questions to Citigroup versus how much time do you afford answering, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith who've got a savings accounts with eleven pounds in it? There's no, you know, I think you're absolutely right that you can't do that for every single customer and go to the level of detail that you want. I think that's why the point that Laura's talking about probably starts to become more relevant, which is if you if you say, well, I'm going to accept the risk that I can't test my processes with this cloud provider because they're not going to play ball. Then what other options are there? So do I say, well, I'm only going to accept organizations that have got um, you know, ISO 27001 or that are prepared to share their SOC reports with me or that have been audited? And I think that's an interesting point for us as auditors and something that um, uh, the AICPA I believe in the US are looking a lot at, which is how can we get to a point of saying you've been cyber security audited and as an industry we can now say that you meet all of the requirements that are out there. Because in, in financial services you trade with a counterparty on the basis that you're all regulated, whether that's by the FFIC or the HKMA or the FCA, that we know that you've all achieved a certain level of compliance. And I think that is probably a big challenge now for the cloud industry to go out and say, yes, I can confirm to you that I've met the requirements, that I've been certified. Um, are we there yet? No, I don't think so. Um, but it, it seems to be the inevitable result, because if we're talking about not just third parties, but fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh parties, well, no, we can't audit every single one. But I think uh, I do think it's a challenge for the industry. Yeah. And I think as well, I mean, in my experience with the smaller third parties that provide this, it's usually, I do work with mainly like Fuzzy 250, so it's quite big, but the, the mom and pop kind of shops are usually one of their bespoke locations, like, you know, somewhere out in, I don't know, Japan, and they have to have information hosted there because of the Japanese regulations and whatnot. Um, it was a specific example of one across or Russia or, um, I find that those people don't have very, they have a lower client base, so they're more flexible about what they're willing to do. So most of the time, we've had to just tell them, you will do this for us and we'll pay you for it, but you'll do that and they and they, they do that. Because they usually have five clients, not 5,000 clients. Um, we've got a smaller base, so they can be more flexible. Um, or we go to who they're subcontracted to and tell them, that's it. <laughs> I think with a lot of these big, cloud service providers with, I think a lot of trust stems from the fact that resilience and security are live or die issues for their businesses and that's, that's what they do. So you've got, you've got to compare, you know, 
AWS whose mission it is to run these reliable applications and keep data safe, that's their absolute mission, to I'm a company in the oil and gas business and I happen to have an IT department who have a rule book that they attempt to follow. Um, the question is who you, <coughs> who you trust. I think, we get, we, I think we get a lot of acquired trust where you know, big platform providers are seen to be successful and we know how important it is to them they carry on being successful. So I'm not sure that's really factual, but I think that, that's the way it happens. Okay, thank you very much. Last question, please, lady at the back. It was a line of Okay. Uh, hi. Um, can I just ask a quick question? A lot of large institutions typically don't try and use one vendor because they will want diverge, you know, diverge increasing operational resiliency, which sort of goes against business process of AWS and Azure. Um, have you come across any examples where um, this actually is a problem contractually for third party management? Because in one way they want you to just buy their service and they will lock you in on big enterprise frameworks to do so. But equally if you're trying to maintain operation resilience or business resiliency, which is the ability to you know, suffer an impact without impacting your clients. Have you, have you seen examples in the 5250 as you've said where you've got a disparity between using one or the other or trying to use both but actually contractually you have to be locked into one of the minor. Yes, I think if I'm if I'm quite honest, this cloud first policy that everybody's adopting and stuff is going to be ten to fifteen years out. I mean they are going with one or two big applications to the cloud and so I think the bigger risk right now is the different communications between your on prem solutions and cloud solutions. That's I think gonna be the bigger problem. I think we need to think about that, but it's also if we think about um, like you said, clouds are very similar to outsourcing. Most people also outsource to the IBMs of the world or TCS. You know, there are just some big players there. So it's not too dissimilar in that niche patch and they can kind of still say, well, we do use a variety of people and this is just one area where we might use everything. So I think that's the response I get from a lot of clients. I've asked that question before, but most of them are several years out from putting everything on the cloud, if ever. Thank you. Okay, sorry, is this a quick question? Yeah, a quick one. I was just gonna say a point, point of note when we had one of the slides with the responsibility. I find that with some of my consulting engagements, it's always difficult to map a uh, accountable person, let alone responsible, to a business process. Is, is that something you're finding in your thematic assessments and results? This was a to a process. So, well, whoever, I mean, there was three of you with it. Uh, well, I, don't know, I, I think I'd, I'd probably go more for, for, for Laura, is it? Laura? Yeah. yeah. So, is it hard to find people who are accountable? Yeah, for, for, for each business process. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and it usually ends up being someone quite senior within the organization, and I usually start with the fact of well, who's going to get fired when this goes wrong? That's usually the first question, and then we work our way back from there. <laughs> um, so I think that I, I always look for the gap between responsibility and accountability. So, okay, the CFO is accountable for everything that money touches. Well, that's kind of hard. Um, and so, therefore, the people responsible become even more key and critical because the gap between CFO and an accounts payable clerk who is a really key part of a control process, for example, is, is quite significant. But um, yeah, and, and, and in these things, the uh, accountability is a bit, sometimes it's been shared, and I tend to discourage that because uh, what's the point in accountability if like 15 people, uh, this isn't a democracy, you know, like you just can't work that way. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our three great speakers.
on the screen uh, behind us, you can see the next two events, which are not IRC events, because IRC is now going to take a break in July and August, and then come back in September. But they are of our sister association, BCS North London branch. The first one is quite clear, and it's a real inspiration event uh, with the title of FinTech and AI. Want to be a FinTech millionaire? I don't know if anybody does. Does anyone want to be a FinTech millionaire here? No? That's fine, because it's completely full with 190 people registered. So I think it's just to watch the space for that one. Um, the other one, uh, which is on the 4th of July, which some people call Independence Day, <laughs> is another women's inspiration event. And it's crystallized a little bit more. It is about cybersecurity and the top table. How do our high-level speakers approach this issue and also talk about gender diversity? Uh, I've got two speakers who are prospective for that. One of them is Cheryl Martin, who's a partner at EY Cybersecurity. And the other one is Sarah Orton, who is a director of risk and uh, controls at um, uh, AstraZeneca. Now, that's slightly to be confirmed, but most of it's there already. If you want to, the booking link is there. So do sign up and come for those. But meanwhile, I said that uh, I saw the London chapter is going into our summer break. That's not to say that we're going to take the summer just lying, uh, lying in the sunshine and nothing else, of course. We do want your input as we plan our next season's events. That's September through till next June. So if you've got ideas on topics, on speakers, and on location, please let me know. If you want to come and see me, that's fine. Otherwise, email admin at isarkalondon.org. Give us your ideas. Tell you what my thinking is at the moment, and that is that we will focus from September to December on cybersecurity. Cybersecurity, the different aspects of cybersecurity, maybe it's auditing or governance or compliance of cybersecurity. We'll focus for that period of time on cybersecurity, and then I'm more open to dealing with our other main topics for ISALCA, which are governance, risk management, assurance, security, and cybersecurity. There is also one other I'm going to add, and that is, in fact, two others, I'm sorry. One, one of them is about women in IT, which we know as the She Leads Tech Program. We are going to major at some times on that, and you can see two aspects of this on screen here. But the other one is about ISACA world. And we had a little sample of that when Christopher came by, because ISACA is going for it in a number of ways. And I want to find out what's happening in other parts of ISACA's world and bring that news to you, share that news with you as well. And ISACA London chapter is, of course, very much a part of that scene. And Ken Spence and I were recently in ISA speaking at an ISACA conference in Sofia, in Bulgaria, where they were really keen to know what we do. And that applies to a whole load of other smaller chapters. So we'll be trying to share information more with them and with you about what they do. So that's it for now. Lots of food for thought, and usual strap line at the end. There's some food and some thinking and a whole lot of networking waiting for you outside. So please enjoy. Come and see us if you have thoughts and ideas. Look forward to seeing you next time.